And now, our celebrity guest this week. He would freely admit that he's addicted to one thing, his job. John Peel has recently celebrated an amazing 40 years on the airwaves. He has a list of awards as long as your arm, including once being named Godlike Genius by the New Musical Express. Kate Sanderson met John at his Suffolk home. John, thanks for inviting us to your house in Suffolk. Uh, library to how many albums is it? Well, uh, about 26 and a half thousand. That is a lot, but I mean, it's just like a mechanic having a good toolkit. Tools rather, of your trade. Yes, it's rather vulgar to brag about it. How did you actually get involved in music in the first place? Well, um, listening to uh, the radio as a child, because you know, we didn't have television, and uh, I was more interested really in the music programmes than in the news programmes. And now, today, it's what, seven to eight hours a day you spend listening to music? hardly represents suffering. As I say, it's not like being in the shipyards or down a mine. Tell me about your, um, your first job in the music business, because you, you blacked it, didn't you? Well, <laughs> uh, uh, the very first thing that I ever did was on the strength of having records that uh, the radio station didn't have. This was in Dallas, Texas. And I took them down there uh, for them to listen to, and uh, they interviewed me on air. I think not because of my extraordinary knowledge of the music, but because by Texas standards, I had such an amusing accent. Your dad sent you out to America um, to be a clerk, was it? Well, he was in the cotton business in, uh, in Liverpool and uh, despairing, as uh, I now know that fathers do about what their <laughs> children are doing or not doing. Uh, he said to me when I came home on leave from national service, he said, uh, I'll send you to the States if you'll go. And in the kind of cocky way that you do when you're 18 or 19, I said, well, yeah, OK, send me, see if I care. And then a few months later, I found myself on board the SS Eugene Likes, bound for Houston, Texas. And at this stage, it was too late to say, Dad, I was only kidding. You know, so <laughs> off I went. How much of it was about um, rebelling against your background and against well, I'd your love dad? Well, I'd, I'd love to portray myself. I'd love to be a You'd hooligan. You'd like to be a rebel. <laughs> I would, yeah. But I just, I'm too innately uh, conservative, really, with a, a small C. But you be. got up to a lot of things there, didn't you? I mean, you had quite a wild time. Well, yeah, first. but uh, I mean, only as wild as anybody else would have had, I think. I, um, you know, it didn't seem wildness at the time. Again, it seemed kind of just what you did. <laughs> I don't know. It's out there that you actually met your first wife, isn't it? It was, yes. I mean, we were fond of each other, you know, but we got married for all the wrong reasons. It was more of a mutual defence pact. It turned out that she um, was actually only 15. Uh, but she persuaded her parents uh, to lie to me and tell me that she was 18. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so when I, when we decided to get married, she then had to admit to only being 15. And I, I couldn't very well say, well, in that case, we're not going to get married. You know, it would seem rather ungallant of the thing to have done. Uh, and there are certain people who seem to um, kind of bring chaos in their train and, and surely a poor woman was one of those. Uh, I'm an anything for a quiet life kind of bloke so we were terribly ill-matched. When you came back to the UK um, you started the BBC then didn't you? you what was it like being part of that big institution, the national institution? Well because I'd grown up with it and, and, and kind of knew it fairly well it was fairly wonderful. I didn't expect to be there very long and, and they didn't expect me to be there very long. I was given a six-week contract initially. Mm. But I had the inside track as the producer wanted me to mm. do it rather than any of the others. And uh, eventually that's what I ended up doing. You've now, in many respects, become part of the establishment. You've got your Radio Force that show, you've got your OBE. Is that something that sits comfortably with you? I don't really see myself as being part of any establishment at all, you know, nor would I really wish to be. And as, again, it's not because I'm kind of uh, rebellious. I'd love to be a hooligan, as I say. I'd love to be a sort of troublemaker. Don't go near him. Whoa. You know, one of, those, <laughs> one of those people who's always been found drunk in, in the gutters in Soho and uh, is much admired for it. But I don't know kind of showbiz people, and I don't know a lot of... Uh, Respectable people, are they? I used to get invited to BBC events at one stage, and, so, and, and at which there'd be an awful lot of very weighty people indeed. Um, they always used to end up with everybody exchanging phone numbers and agreeing to get together at some stage, but and never, did, so. never involving. Well, no, but never involving me. It was always <laughs> kind of, uh, um, and uh, I just felt as though I'd, I didn't belong. And, and did you that know, trouble you, or did you just? Well, it kind of, of doesn't, doesn't at the same time. You know, you think I'd like to belong, but then you think. 
when they phoned up and said, look, we're having a house party at our place in Wellington, in Shropshire, would you like to come? You think, not in a million years, you know, so... Uh, so you're antisocial, is what you're not saying? Anti no, no, I'm just perfectly satisfied with, uh, um, with Stowe Market, you know, and, and the people that we know and, mm. and like. The, uh, I suppose part of the attraction that or part, your fans like you because you are a normal bloke. You know, fans, they, you see, you, this, you can't judge fans. Is fans a bad word? So. Well, it, it sort of is because of the implication of fans is people. Well, it's, listeners it's then. Sort of unreason, really. Yeah, listeners it, it'll do, yeah. Because I always see myself your listeners as listeners who regularly tune in because they rather like you. They like what we do, you know. Mm. Um, I say we, I mean, that's myself and the producer and the, mm. and me, the programme assistant. Will you ever give up being a DJ? I enjoy doing what I do so much I can barely find the words to describe the pleasure I get from it. And sometimes it's like you get a programme going and it's, I feel as I imagine people must feel if they're surfing or something. You're on the wave and you think, wow, I'm, going, I'm, I'm up here and it's going and hell like this, everything's going fine. And it's really exciting and then uh, sometimes you fall off and other times you carry on all the way to the beach. Well, John, stay with us. We're going to take a little bit of a break now. Okay. Later we'll be talking about your wife and why you call her pig. Okay. Find out later. Kate, thank you. Ross, I want you to know I enjoy what I do on Sunday mornings with you so much I can barely describe it. Bless him for that. There's so few people that would say that about their job, isn't there? Really? And he's a lucky man that he still can after 40 years. Mm. There is a John Ravenscroft, the real there name. Is, there, there is. There is a real man yeah. there. What a swine he is. <laughs> why did you decide to change your name? Well, it wasn't really my idea. Um, when I was looking for work, uh, when I came back from the States in 1967 and went to Radio London, and they said, uh, what do you want to call yourself? And I said, well, you know, John Ravenscroft, because it's my name. And they said, well, it's too long a name, people will not remember it. And so we argued about various other names, and then there's a woman typing, you know, with an earshot, and she said, why don't you call him John Peel? So... Uh, and that's how it happened. That's how it happened. And I, I was desperate for work, so... I could have been anything. I wouldn't have cared, you know. But even your own kids didn't know no, that you I, were John no, Peel, did all. they? No, they didn't. And in fact, William, who was the eldest, was six before he ever heard the name John Peel. And somebody rang up and said, can I speak to John Peel? And William misheard or misunderstood and came to me and said, uh, there's somebody called John Peel on the phone. And I said, no, no, that's, that's the name that I use at work, William. Um, and that was the end. I mean, he, wasn't, he didn't say why or anything. He just you know, went back to the TV. Did you, when you were sort of thinking about having kids, did you sort of think about your own childhood and say, well, I'm not going to do it this way because it was like this for me? I used to be very resentful of my, of my parents because they weren't um, affectionate people. Mm. And, and uh, society was very sort of brittle. Mm. And um, people's conversations and relationships with one another also be, seemed to be based on kind of clever put-downs and, and appearing to be you know, unfeeling and insensitive. It's difficult to explain, really, but um, so to have shown affection towards your children would have been a sign of weakness in a funny way. And then I, I reached the point at which uh, I felt that they were the ones who'd really missed out because I had, uh, you know, I, I had Sheila and, uh, uh, and our children who would kind of come into your room at five o'clock in the morning and get into bed with you and then wee on you and go back to their <laughs> own dry bed. And uh, I thought of the two. Um, that that was probably preferable. We were talking about Sheila. You described her in the past as, as being the saving of you. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I just think I'd, I'd not be here and I'd not be... I mean, I don't mean I'd be dead, but I, you know, I'd not be doing something that I wanted to do in the way that I want to do it if uh, I hadn't met her. Not, not just her. Her, her parents were amazing, and her, you know, her, her family generally. Um, so I just... I, I, it's the support. Yeah, I just consider I was amazingly lucky to marry into her family, obviously, so... And what's with the pig and the piglet name? Oh, well, that's, that's, that's only because she snorts when, when she laughs. There's nothing more complicated than that. Uh, and she always has... Uh, I don't do it, but <laughs> none of the children do, I think. And I've never been aware of them snorting. You've experienced so many different things with your wife. The thing that really scared you was when Sheila had a brain hemorrhage. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, so I don't want to, you know, because I, uh, I, 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 I hate the fact. I hate the fact. You know. Yes. Yeah. I hate the fact that I get upset mm. uh, when I talk about this, but I do because it was uh, um, just so frightening. Uh, because you were away at the time, weren't you? I was. I was on the Isle of Man, and we got a phone call from uh, 
our Alexandra saying that mum's had a brain hemorrhage. Well, I didn't really know what a brain hemorrhage was, mm. you know. So uh, I, I said to her, well, uh, you know, I'll be home in a couple of days. And they, she said, Dad, she's dying. So obviously I panicked, as you would, and uh, I drove overnight because I felt that if I drove in some way, I was doing something, you know, if I could have sat there mm. and been driven because that would have been too passive a role to have played. Obviously, I mean, she could have died at any at any moment. Um, and uh, but the the great uh, saving uh, was, was the fact that she never lost consciousness mm -hmm. and uh, didn't lose any brain function. Although I occasionally tease her that she did, of course, in a <laughs> mind sensitive way. But um, has it made you crystallise what you think about life after death? Um, well, I don't really believe that there is any life That's after it. death. You're yeah. gone. I'd love to believe that there was. Yeah, because I'd love to. Uh, you know, I'd love to see my mum and dad again, you know what I mean? And, and uh, sort out uh, with my dad whether he wanted me or my brother to have the Welsh dresser, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, stuff like that. I know I would, it's not one of those things I would, what I'd say I want to mar meet Martin Luther King or, uh, <laughs> or Shakespeare or anything like that. So I'd just keep it domestic. Do you literally have a day-to-day -day belief system? Well, you breathe, uh, you sleep, you listen to your music, one day you die, when you take. Yeah, that's it. That's but you have thought it through, haven't you? Because you've chosen the song you want played at your funeral. Yeah. You never yeah. walk alone. Well, that. Or has it changed? No, no. You obviously have. You never walk alone. Quite clearly. I mean, a funeral wouldn't be a funeral without it. But then, uh, also, teen the undertones, teenage kicks, because I want to have uh, on the on my tombstone, mm. uh, teenage dreams so hard to beat, because mm. it seems to sum it all up, really. Because. Uh, I suppose, because my teenage dreams came true, you know, so it's corny stuff, but they came true, and, and in that I know I'm extraordinarily lucky. Most people, uh, that doesn't happen for most people. Thank you very much, John. But a while left before we need to play that. What a lovely cottage. I've forgotten how great that record was, and he really sponsored the undertones good for us. And one good thing he did, he did seven. It was uh, bringing the undertones to the nation. There we go.